<clears throat> Hello, I'm Tom Kimmel. Were I asked by the Bureau for Correction of Naval Records to make a presentation to the Bureau for Correction of Naval Records, BCNR, today, August 29th, 2017, concerning my April 7th, 2017 application to BCNR in the matter of the advancement of Rear Admiral Husband Kimmel on the retired list to Admiral, which would be BCNR docket number 443017, this would be it. This is the first page of my application, which I submitted to you. So uh, let's, let's fill in the blanks. Section 5 of the application prompts me to request how I want the error and injustice in the naval records of Rear Admiral Kimmel to be corrected. Accordingly, here is my request of BCNR. I request that the Department of the Navy posthumously take appropriate action pursuant to Title 10 of the United States Code, Section 1370C, to place Rear Admiral Husband E. Kimmel on the retired list with the rank of full admiral, had to be four stars, the highest grade in which he served when on active duty. That is, I request that the Board for Correction of Naval Records, BCNR, recommend that the Secretary of the Navy recommend that the Secretary of Defense further recommend that the President of the United States nominate Rear Admiral Kimmel for advancement on the retired list to Admiral O-10. Section 6 of the application prompts me to identify what I believe to be the particulars of the error in the naval records. Accordingly, here are the particulars. First, in 1987, BCNR erroneously closed administratively a previous application to it by Admiral Kimmel's surviving sons. That would be my father and my uncle for lack of authority over the requested relief. Their application, however, merely requested that BCNR take appropriate action pursuant to the relief requested, regardless of their lack of authority to directly grant advancement of Admiral Kimmel. Second, I believe the record to be an error in the following particular. The secretary of a military department acting through boards of civilians of that military department may correct any military record of the secretary's department when the secretary considers it necessary to correct an error or remove an injustice. The Department of the Navy's letter dated 9 June 1987 mischaracterized and misapplied the Attorney General's 1948 opinion. The Attorney General actually found that while it was not within the power of either the Secretary of the Navy or the Board for Correction of Naval Records to restore the subject officer to his former position, it would not be unprecedented for the Secretary of the Navy to recommend to the President a nomination so worded, worded as to accomplish the result contemplated by the finding of the board. The Attorney General's opinion, read in conjunction with appropriate statutes, confirms that BCNR may adjudicate the application for correction of Admiral Kimmel's records and may fashion a remedy consistent with presidential nomination and Senate confirmation. Third, as an example of the proceeding, the widow of General John D. Lavelle, 
secured a recommendation from the Air Force Board for Correction of Military Records that pertinent records be corrected to show that the Secretary of the Air Force recommended that the President nominate General Lavelle to be retired in the grade of General 010, and that action be initiated to obtain Senate confirmation, and that the recommendation be forwarded to the Secretary of Defense, and that all other actions within the authority of the Air Force be taken with a view to securing his nomination, confirmation, and appointment to the grade of general. In General Lavelle's case, the recommendations of the Air Force Board for Correction of Military Records were adopted by the Secretary of the Air Force in October 2009. Thereafter, the Secretary of Defense recommended General Lavelle and President Obama, Obama nominated General Lavelle for posthumous advancement on the retired list. Of course, notwithstanding the President's nomination, the Senate Armed Services Committee did not vote on the nomination, which by operation of law returned to, the to return the nomination to President Obama. But of course the point is that the Air Force Board for Correction of Military Records heard the matter and made positive recommendation. Section 6 of the application prompts me to demonstrate why I believe the record to be unjust. Admiral Husband E. Kimmel was Commander-in-Chief of the United States and Pacific Fleets at the time of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Shortly thereafter, on December 18, 1941, President Roosevelt appointed a commission to investigate the attack chaired by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Owen G. Roberts. The commission, which became known as the Roberts Commission, issued its report on January 23, 23, 1942. This report charged Admiral Kimmel with dereliction of duty and was undoubtedly the basis for the Department of the Navy's not placing Admiral Kimmel on the retired list with the rank of Admiral. Subsequent investigations of the Pearl Harbor attack did not sustain the Roberts Commission's charge that Admiral Kimmel was derelict in his duty. Second, in 1948, the Navy Department unjustly omitted the name of Admiral Kimmel from the list of flag officers whose promotion was authorized pursuant to the Officer Personnel Act of 1947. That would be everyone else without any reference to his or anyone's performance constituting a belated special disciplinary action of a punitive kind taken without notice to the officer specifically singled out by such omission, Admiral Kimmel. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number one, the applicant is Admiral Kimmel's eldest grandson and a former naval officer. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number two, until he died in 1968, my grandfather fought valiantly to have his name cleared in connection with the Pearl Harbor attack. But for his efforts, there would never have been a Naval Court of Inquiry or a congressional investigation of the Pearl Harbor attack. He and his counsel brought these about. It was his goal to bring before the public as much information as he possibly could about the attack. But for their efforts, the circumstances surrounding the Pearl Harbor attack would have gone down in history unknown. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact that, number three, the Naval Court of Inquiry was of the opinion that no offenses had been committed nor serious blame incurred on the part of any person in the Naval Service 
and recommended that no further proceedings be had in this matter. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact that number four, the joint congressional report found that the errors made by the Hawaiian commands were errors of judgment and not dereliction of duty. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number five, that court-martial proceedings were never instituted against Admiral Kimmel. Indeed, the director of naval history, Admiral Sam Cox, sent to every admiral in the United States Navy the last Pearl Harbor Day celebration on December 7, 2016, a message. In pertinent part, it said, an unstated reason for denying Kimmel a requested court-martial is that a trial would have risked the reputations of many senior military and government officials in Washington who were far more capable, culpable of the failures that led to surprise at Pearl Harbor than Kimmel was. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number six, that the other principal naval officer involved in the Pearl Harbor attack, then Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Stark, was permitted to retain the rank of admiral throughout his active duty naval career subsequent to Pearl Harbor, despite the fact that he did not transmit to Admiral Kimmel important information which he had regarding the Japanese situation. When Stark retired, he was placed on the retired list with the rank of four-star admiral pursuant to Title 10 United States Code, Section 1370C. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number seven, that of the, of the nine official investigations of the Pearl Harbor attack, the Roberts Commission was the only one which charged Admiral Kimmel with dereliction of duty. Indeed, several of the other investigations made specific findings to the contrary. <clears throat> Here is the updated story within the Pearl Harbor story. Recall that nine days after the Pearl Harbor attack, the President of the United States selected a sitting Supreme Court Associate Justice, Owen Roberts, to investigate the Army and the Navy only, and then only, in Hawaii. Ten days after the Pearl Harbor attack, Admiral Kimmel and General Short, the head of the Army Hawaiian Command, were fired and replaced. Eleven days after the Pearl Harbor attack, Justice Roberts began his deliberations. He deliberated for 36 days, 47 days after the Pearl Harbor attack. He wrote a report, sent it to the President of the United States, declaring, declaring Admiral Kimmel and General Short solely responsible for the success of the Japanese attack and derelict in their duty. The President of the United States signed the report and unredacted released it to the press immediately. That would have been the end of the story, the end of the Pearl Harbor story, soup to nuts. But for one man, Captain Lawrence Safford, the head of Op 20G, the head of Naval Communications Intelligence, indeed the revered father of Naval Communications Intelligence. He went to visit Admiral Kimmel living in disgrace in February of 1944 in Bronxville, New York. Unannounced, Captain Safford went into my grandfather's office and asked Admiral Kimmel, Admiral, did you have available to you the same information we had available to us 
in Washington, D.C. from the secret decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications in a program we code, codenamed MAGIC. Did you have that information available to you prior to the attack in Hawaii that gave us in Washington, D.C., indications of the time, place, reason, and the sea plan to cover the attack? Did you have that information available to you prior to the attack in Hawaii, Admiral? Admiral Kimmel looked at Captain Safford and said, Captain, what in the world are you talking about? What is magic? Captain Safford explained. Admiral Kimmel that very day turned into a fighting tiger, got himself legal representation out of Boston. The junior attorney on that legal team, headed by Charles Rugg, the junior attorney was Ed Hannafy. Ed Hannafy took Safford's information and actually wrote the enabling legislation, which took the Naval Affairs Committee. The Naval Affairs Committee was so impressed with what they saw, they took it to the full Congress, and the full Congress ordered the Army and the Navy to conduct further investigations, and there would have been no further investigation of the Pearl Harbor attack 47 days after the attack. That's the real story within the Pearl Harbor story. One man's determination to get the facts of the Pearl Harbor story before the American public, and that man was my grandfather. This slide, this chronology, indeed just the first listed investigation in the chronology tells you all you really need to know. The first investigation, number one, Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, secretly reported to the President that though the exact timing of a surprise Japanese move was clearly known in Washington, D.C., Admiral Kimmel and General Short were not alerted. And the fighter planes they needed had been sent to the British, the Dutch, the Chinese, and the Russians. The next day, however, Secretary Knox was told to tell the press merely that Hawaii was not alert. The press was then free to take it up a notch and report that Hawaii was asleep. So in the blink of an eye, Hawaii went from not alerted to asleep. Knox's secret report was known to Chairman Roberts, but not revealed to Kimmel and Short. Investigation number two before you. Here's the dark heart of the Roberts Commission matter. The Washington High Command, that is, the head of the Army and the Navy and their respective chiefs of operations and intelligence, falsely testified to the Roberts Commission that Kimmel and Short had the same magic information in Hawaii as they had in Washington, D.C. This false information did Kimmel and Short irreparable prejudice. The Washington High Command had an obligation as officers and decent human beings to rectify the prejudice to Kimmel and Short from such deplorable misinformation. They did not do so. Indeed, three days after the Roberts Commission, Marshall, Stark, Stinson, and Judge Advocate General Gatch agreed on a plan to avoid further investigation of Pearl Harbor especially how to avoid a naval court of inquiry. I'll cover this in a moment. Investigation number three, Captain Safford revealed magic to Admiral Hart in the Hart investigation. Investigation number four, Admiral Kimmel indirectly, indirectly revealed magic to the Army Pearl Harbor Board after General Marshall had committed perjury and ordered his subordinates to do the same. Marshall was severely criticized. Investigation number five, the Naval Court of Inquiry virtually exonerated Admiral Kimmel and criticized Admiral Stark. Please note well, the Washington High Command discussed magic freely with the Roberts Commission in 1941, when an impression could be left that Kimmel and Short had magic, but in 1944, when that was no longer possible, 
the Washington High Command declared that magic could not be discussed with the Naval Court of Inquiry or the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Clearly, the Washington High Command was playing games with the truth. Investigations 6, 7, and 8, the Clark, Clausen, and Hewitt investigations tinkered at the margins. Investigation number 9, the Joint Congressional Committee found no dereliction of duty. Number 10, my father and uncle submitted our first application to the Bureau for Correction of Naval Records for advancement of Admiral Kimmel on the retired list. It was inappropriately denied for lack of jurisdiction of the relief requested. In other words, BCNR refused to hear the matter. <sighs> Investigation number 11. Unlike BCNR, the Army Board for Correction of Military Records did hear the matter, found injustice, and recommended the relief requested, advancement of General Short posthumously on the retired list. But the re recommendation was overruled by higher authority without an alternative finding of facts. Investigation number 12, the Dorn Report recognized for the first time in 54 years that responsibility for the success of the Japanese attack should be broadly shared. But of course, it has not been. Indeed, the report did not identify who else should share in the responsibility for the success of the Japanese attack. Even though, as the director of Naval History recently wrote, they were far more culpable of the failures that led to surprise at Pearl Harbor than was Kimmel. Investigation uh, number 13. The Air Force Board for Correction of Military Records heard the matter of cashiered Air Force Major General John Lavelle, found injustice, and recommended the relief requested, posthumous advancement of General Lavelle, as did the Secretary of the Air Force, the Secretary of Defense, and President Obama. But the Senate Armed Services Committee did not confirm the nomination. Senator McCain let it lapse the term of the Senate. Number 14, BCNR. On April 7, 2017, I submitted our family's second application to BCNR for the advancement of Rear Admiral Kimmel to Admiral on the retired list. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact number eight that recent writings on the subject of the Pearl Harbor attack indicated an increasing awareness that it was patently unfair to place the responsibility for the losses at Pearl Harbor solely on the Hawaiian command. The most recent book on the subject, which defends Admiral Kimmel, is A Matter of Honor by Anthony Summers and Robin Swan, published in 2016. Other Pearl Harbor books published in 2016 include Countdown to Pearl Harbor by Steve Tomei, Pearl Harbor from Infamy, Infamy to Greatness by Craig Nelson, All the Gallant Men by Don Stratton, and several others. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact number nine that, as is apparent from the preceding, the subject of Pearl Harbor will not die. The public is not satisfied with official explanations to date. The public and responsible historians simply will not accept that the Hawaiian commanders were solely responsible for the losses at Pearl Harbor. And indeed, with every new book, new information comes to light and is brought into focus. <clears> Thank <throat> you.
The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact number 10, that there is new and extraordinary information contained in a matter of honor. For example, number one, example one, how false testimony and false evidence provided to investigators did Admiral Kimmel and General Short irreparable prejudice. Providers of false information as officers and decent human beings knowing full well what they had done had an obligation to rectify the prejudice to Kimmel and Short from such deplorable misinformation. They did not do so. That alone should be enough to compel the relief sought. Posthumous advancement of Kimmel on the retired list. For a second example, how magic was discussed freely with the Roberts Commission in 1941 when an impression could be left that Kimmel and Short had magic. But in 1944, when that was no longer possible, the Navy and War Departments declared that magic could not be discussed with the Naval Court of Inquiry or the Army Pearl Harbor Board. For a third example, how Admiral Kimmel came to be the only qualified flag officer in World War II not advanced under the Officer Personnel Act of 1947. Chief of Naval Personnel Vice Admiral James Holloway Jr. recommended advancement of Kimmel in his 1954 memorandum to the Secretary of the Navy, noting that in 1948, the Navy Department merely omitted the name of Admiral Kimmel from the list of flag officers whose promotion was authorized. That would be everyone else. This was done without any reference to Kimmel's or anyone's performance, constituting a belated special disciplinary action of a punitive kind taken without notice to the officer, specifically singled out by such omission Admiral Kimmel. <clears throat> Additional new information in the book, A Matter of Honor, includes example four, how the Navy Department misled Kimmel regarding the known threat from airdropped shallow water torpedoes. Example number five, how the Navy Department misled Kimmel regarding available spy reports. Example number six, how the Navy Department misled Kimmel regarding the November 26, 1941 American note to Japan. Example number seven, how Admiral Kimmel was manipulated into retirement. And example number eight, how perjury before the Naval Court of Inquiry was even worse than perjury before the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Concerning the fourth example, Admiral Kimmel was affirmatively misled by the Navy Department in many ways. This was one. Why did Kimmel not realize how vulnerable the fleet was in Pearl Harbor because of, in his words, this torpedo business. Well, Kimmel was affirmatively misled by Chief of Naval Operations Stark in official dispatches, in two official dispatches in February and in June 1941, when he was told that British aircraft airdropped torpedoes dropped on the Italian fleet at Toronto, were dropped in 84 feet and 66 feet of water or more, respectively. The depth of water in Pearl Harbor is 30 feet generally and 42 feet in the channel. That's why Kimmel did not realize how vulnerable the fleet was in Pearl Harbor because of this torpedo business. <clears throat> this torpedo business is terribly important. Let's analyze it. Here's a summary of it. O and I received Lieutenant Commander John Oppie's Toronto raid chart indicating that torpedoes were airdropped in 24 feet of water. 
It was received on January 9, 1941 at ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence. Admiral Kimmel was not told this, nor was any Pearl Harbor investigation told this, to include the Dorn Report. February 15, 1941, Admiral Kimmel was told by Admiral Stark that torpedoes were airdropped in 84 feet of water or more at Toronto. In June of 1941, Admiral Kimmel was told by Admiral Stark's deputy, Admiral Ingersoll, in an official dispatch that torpedoes were airdropped in 66 feet of water or more at Toronto. Later in June, the Navy Department was told that torpedoes were airdropped in 42 feet of water at Dakar at Mears El Kabur. This was the famous attack of the British fleet on the French fleet. Kimmel was not told this, nor, amazingly, was the Naval Court of Inquiry told this. That's why the Naval Court of Inquiry mistakenly styled in their report Japanese shallow water airdrop torpedoes as a secret weapon unknown to any other Navy in the world at that time. It was unknown to the Naval Court of Inquiry and to Admiral Kimmel, but certainly not unknown to the Navy Department in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> July 15, 1941, the Navy Department was told that British torpedoes could be successfully airdropped in 24 feet of water. Kimmel was not told, nor was any Pearl Harbor investigation told. <clears throat> Lieutenant Commander John Oppie, United States Navy, was a United States Naval Observer on HMS Illustrious when she attacked the Italian fleet at Toronto, November 11, 1940. The Conte, the battleship Conte de Cabor was sunk. Two other battleships were put out of action for many months. Lieutenant Commander Oppie's report arrived at the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, D.C. on January 9, 1941. Attached to Oppie's report was this post-attack chart. Clusters of T-symbols show where the British dropped torpedoes. The chart also shows the depth of water in those areas. The torpedoes marked on the chart at a position that lines up with the battleship Conte de Colore were dropped at a point at which most depths were identified as being only about four fathoms. That's 24 feet. Lieutenant Commander Oppie, who had himself briefly served at Pearl Harbor, felt that his knowledge of the Toronto attack was very relevant. In mid-January 1941, as his stint in the Mediterranean was coming to an end, he sent in a suggestion. I honestly feel, he wrote, that I should fly to Hawaii and talk to the boys there on my war experiences and how to train to meet the lessons learned. No one took him up on the proposal. A week after Admiral Stark's deputy's letter, that would be Ingersoll's letter, went off, headquarters, that's O and I, received a report from England with intelligence on another of the British attacks of the previous year. In the attack on the French battleship Richelieu at Dakar, the report noted the water depth had been only seven fathoms, that's 42 feet. Receipt of that information alone would have surely have alerted Admiral Kimmel and his aides at Pearl Harbor and caused them to reevaluate the possible risk to Pearl. A Navy review of the files conducted later, however, would note there was no indication that the document was sent to the Pacific Fleet. Here's a clearer look at the Toronto chart attached to Oppie's report of the attack and received in ONI in January 1941. On the chart, you'll see two T symbols indicating a torpedo drop. The chart itself is marked with depths and fathoms. It shows at least one of the torpedoes going down in a spot where depths were recorded as three to three and three quarter fathoms. That would be 18 to 22 feet. 
concerning the fifth example. Admiral Kimmel was misled by the Navy Department regarding available spy reports. This is one of three available spy reports not sent to Kimmel. Captain Ulrich von der Osten and Kurt Friedrich Ludwig were German spies. On March 18, 1941, Abur officer Captain Ulrich von der Osten was killed in Times Square, New York. His partner Ludwig fled with Osteen's briefcase. The FBI found in Osteen's apartment Osteen's report on defenses at Pearl Harbor. With Osteen's comment <coughs> that this will be of interest mostly to our yellow allies. In pertinent part, the report said, Navy, said to be stationed in Pearl Harbor and rest of islands, 150 units of all kinds, seen in harbor about 50 vessels at least, five armored ships, big battleships, question mark, Saratoga and other, very small aircraft carrier, the last one outside of harbor, other big one besides Saratoga said to be there, seen several units of destroyers, each, four of them, tied to other, slightly higher, outmoded, looking ship, seen destroyers, <coughs> hull numbers, 372, 383, 374, 375, couldn't read other numbers, one dry dock, a thousand feet, stationary, other swimming dock of same length, said arrived recently, along east side of harbor, near submarine station, about 80 fuel tanks, this will be of interest mostly to our yellow allies, are you interested? Might be a good idea to dispatch observer. If you are, want me to find somebody. Here's a second spy report available in July 1941. <clears throat> it revealed that the British could successfully airdrop torpedoes in water as shallow as four fathoms, 24 feet. Of course, the vast majority of damage at Pearl Harbor was inflicted by airdrop torpedoes. Secretary of the Navy Forrestal blamed Kimmel for not using torpedo nets, even though they didn't have torpedo nets out in Pearl Harbor, nor did they have the ability to make them. <clears throat> Admiral Lockwood's report was not sent to Hawaii, nor revealed to the Joint Congressional Committee. And indeed, it wasn't even declassified in 1990, until 1998. Here's a third spy report available in August 1941. It is my contention that if Popoff's spy questionnaire requesting water depth and torpedo net use at Pearl Harbor had been sent to Admiral Kimmel, which it wasn't, Pearl Harbor investigators would have bludgeoned him with it. Popoff's spy questionnaire was kept secret from all Pearl Harbor investigations. <clears throat> Concerning the sixth example, Admiral Kimmel was misled by the Navy Department regarding the November 26, 1941 American note. Recall that on November 5, 1941, the Chief of Naval Operations and the Chief of Staff wrote a memorandum to the President of the United States making recommendations. They were in accord in the following recommendations. War between the United States and Japan should be avoided while building up defense, defensive forces in the Far East until such time as Japan attacks. Specifically, they recommended that no ultimatum be delivered to Japan. This memo, dated November 5, 1941, was sent to Admiral Kimmel by Admiral Stark on November 14, 1941. Admiral Kimmel received it on November 20, 1941. What was never conveyed to Admiral Kimmel was that President Roosevelt ignored Marshall and Stark's advice and recommendation and went ahead and sent an ultimatum to Japan on November 26. This affirmatively misleading, misleading Kimmel again. He had been promised on multiple occasions 
that he would be sent all the information that bore upon his problem in the Pacific. Accordingly, he thought he was receiving such information, and he wasn't. Concerning the seventh example, from this memorandum, written three days after the Roberts Commission by Chief of Staff Marshall, it's clear that Marshall, Secretary of War Stimson, Chief of Naval Operations Stark, and Judge Advocate General Gatch devised a way to avoid further investigation by limiting investigation to the Roberts Commission and manipulating Kimball and Short into retirement. Marshall, Stimson, Stark, and Gatch all agree the Roberts Commission was on a plane above that of a Naval Court of Inquiry and therefore rendered a Naval Court of Inquiry unnecessary and to be refused if a Naval Court of Inquiry is requested. The same day, Admiral Stark ordered Admiral Jacobs to advise Kimmel of General Short's decision to retire in hopes that Kimmel would likewise apply for retirement. <clears throat> Summers and Swan discovered this transcript in Admiral Nimitz's papers at the Naval History and Heritage Center, a remarkable find. Vice Admiral Randall Jacobs, Chief of the Bureau of Navigation and Personnel, Vice Admiral John Wills Greenslade, Commandant, San Francisco. The transcript, Admiral Jacobs, has Kimmel returned yet? Admiral Greenslade, yes, he's here. Jacobs, I've just been discussing the matter with Admiral Stark, and they want Kimmel kept in a leave status until further disposition is made of the report. I was asked by Admiral Stark to inform you to tell Kimmel that General Short has applied for retirement. Greenslade, in a leave status? You want me to tell him that? Jacobs, yes. Before this suggestion, Admiral Kimmel had not even considered retirement, expected and stood ready to be reassigned. Concerning the eighth example, how perjury before the Naval Court of Inquiry was even worse than perjury before the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Recall the actions of President Roosevelt, Chief of Staff Marshall, and Chief of Naval Operations Stark the evening of December 6, 1941, Saturday evening before the attack, after President Roosevelt read the 13th part of the 14th part Magic Intercept and declared, this means war. <clears throat> On January 2, 1946, the Joint Congressional Committee put Admiral Stark under oath and asked him about his recollection of the matter, of which he had none. They asked him the same question the next day, January 3, 1946. Admiral Stark said he could not recall. In May of 1946, the Joint Congressional Committee shut down. A week later, Admiral Stark's flag lieutenant, Admiral Captain Harold Crick, went to Admiral Stark and said, Admiral, don't you remember where you were? You were with me, sir, on the night of December 6th, Saturday night before the attack. You were with me, sir, and our wives were viewing the student prints at the National Theater. <clears throat> After the performance, we retired to your quarters. The houseboy greeted you with a message that the President of the United States had called and wanted you to call back. You excused yourself, went to the library for a few minutes, came back out and said you had been discussing with the president the critical situation in the Pacific. The Joint Congressional Committee had to reconvene to take Crick's testimony. They asked Captain Crick how he could remember this, and, captain, and Admiral Stark could not. Admiral, and captain Crick said, you know, forget that sort of thing. <clears throat> Admiral Stark was placed back under oath and asked uh, questions 
as he could remember that evening. Captain Crick, notwithstanding, he said he could not remember that evening. This prompted Congressman Gerhardt to ask Admiral Stark, could you, Admiral Stark, have been with General Marshall? Since he can't remember where he was the evening of December 6th, Saturday night, either. <clears throat> One of Admiral Stark's aides was Vice Admiral William Smedberg III, United States Naval Academy, class of 1926, Superintendent of the Naval Academy, 1956 to 1958. Chief of Naval Personnel, 1960 to 1964. President of the Naval Academy Alumni Association, 1965 to 67. This is from his published 1981 reminiscence. <clears throat> Did you get all that, Smitty? I, Admiral Smedberg, kept a wax cylinder record of everything President Roosevelt said to Admiral Stark. The president would call up and say, Betty, a nickname for Admiral Stark, I want this done right away. And he'd give five or six things in rapid fire order. Admiral Stark would say, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President. Have you got that, Betty? Yes, Mr. President, he'd hang up. The buzzer would ring in my office and I would go in to hear Admiral Stark say, did you get all that, Smitty? Yes, sir, I said. We'll get going on it. I monitored nearly every conversation Admiral Stark had, and I made a record of almost all of them. Every now and then, when it was a personal thing, Stark would tell me to destroy the record. So why is that important? Well, this is brand new, extraordinary information available in Summers and Swan's book. A matter of honor. The Naval Court of Inquiry interrogated Admiral Stark extensively. Question number 388 from the Naval Court of Inquiry. Did you, Admiral Stark, ever keep any record of your conversations with President Roosevelt during the year 1941? Admiral Stark's answer no, I did not. Four points to make here. Admiral Hewitt, in his investigation, asked Admiral Smedberg, Captain Smedberg at the time, have you anything further, Captain? Captain Smedberg replied, no, sir. Second point. Captain Smedberg took a special oath to maintain the security of the information developed during the Hewitt investigation. A third point, Admiral Stark was asked by the Naval Court of Inquiry whether Captain Smedberg acted in an advisory, administrative, or in what capacity. Stark replied that Smedberg acted largely in the capacity of a regular flag lieutenant's duties. My fourth point, at the Naval Court of Inquiry, Admiral Stark introduced Captain Smedberg as additional counsel. Admiral Smedberg's wiretap of the president. Admiral Smedberg kept a wax cylinder recording of everything President Roosevelt said to CNO Stark monitored nearly every telephone conversation Stark had, and he made a recording of them. Secretary of State Cordell Hull called Stark and said, Admiral, I'm afraid the fat's in the fire. It's up to you military fellows now. I heard the conversation. It was on one of those wax cylinders I broke up. Now, I wish I hadn't destroyed them. Okay, why is Stark and Smedberg's recorded conversation with Secretary of State Cordell Hull important? <clears throat> Here's why. 
On November 27, 1941, Admiral Stark testified to the Naval Court of Inquiry, I do not recall having seen the November 26, 1941 American note or having heard anything about it. I haven't the slightest recollection of that note. Seemed hard to believe, and the Joint Congressional Committee thought so too. Two years later, Admiral Stark testified to the Joint Congressional Committee, two years after his testimony to the Naval Court of Inquiry. Counsel for the Joint Congressional Committee, Gerhard Gazelle, asked Admiral Stark, the evidence here shows that the note, Hull's note, was intercepted in the regular course and was among the Japanese intercepts. In other words, the text of the note being transmitted to the Japanese representatives here in Washington to Tokyo. Admiral Stark, that is true. I think that was on the 28th. Gazelle, do you think you saw it then on the 28th? Admiral Stark, I could not be sure. I would like to say with regard to that 10-point note, while not recollecting having seen it at that time, that I had discussed it in the State Department, a memorandum by Mr. Morgenthau, Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau, and expressed my opinion on it and confirmed it in writing. The note of the 26, the 10-point note, as I recall, contained nothing, or at least very little, or only minor differences from the note of the Secretary of the Treasury, and also did not contain anything which I had objected to in the other note. So in general, I knew of the substance of that note, but as to having seen it in its actual form when it went out, or whether I saw it on the 28th, I could not say. <coughs> Please note here, Admiral Stark said he expressed his opinion on Secretary Morgenthau's note, which was actually written by his number one aide, Harry Dexter White. Harry Dexter White, as we found out later through Venona, was a Soviet spy. <clears throat> Stark said he expressed his opinion on Harry Dexter White's memo and confirmed it in writing. The investigator in me must ask, Judge Gazelle, why didn't you ask for that writing? Oh, well. Onward. The board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number 11, that it has been only after 75 years that the inherent injustice in the treatment of the principal naval actors in the Pearl Harbor matter has come to light so clearly. Only last December, on the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, the Henderson, Kentucky War Memorial Association dedicated a statue to Admiral Kimmel, which speaks directly to the injustice suffered by him. <clears throat> the board should find it in the interest of justice to consider the application because of the fact, number 12, that Admiral Arleigh Burke, former Chief of Naval Operations, wrote in 1991 to Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney at the Secretary's request. This matter is important not because of the importance to the Kimmel family, but because of the importance to the Navy as an institution. These are the attachments to my original April 7th, 2017 application to BCNR. These are additional attachments to my application to BCNR. More additional attachments. <clears throat> now, 
Okay, there are 15 attachments to uh, my application, A through O. This is the first page of attachment A, the application my father and uncle submitted exactly 30 years before my submission. This is attachment B. In June 1987, the executive director of the Bureau for Correction of Naval Records refused to hear the merits of Admiral Kimmel's surviving son's application for correction of military records in the case of their father and wrote in pertinent part that the relief requested of placing Rear Admiral Kimmel on the retired list as an admiral is not within the authority of the Board for Correction of Naval Records. Therefore, the case is being closed administratively. Attachment C. Title 10 of the United States Code annotated, Section 1552 provides in pertinent part that a board established under subsection A may execute a failure to file within three years after discovery if it finds it to be in the interest of justice. Attachment D, 1948. The United States Attorney General concerning the correction of military and naval records wrote in pertinent part that it would not be unprecedented for the Secretary of the Navy to recommend to the President a nomination so worded as to accomplish the result contemplated by the finding of the board. Attachment E is of particular importance. Chief of Naval Personnel Holloway's 1954 memo to the Secretary of the Navy provided in pertinent part, the fact remains that an officer of over 40 years of honorable service to his country was summarily removed from his command and allowed to retire without being brought to trial for his alleged failure to carry out his responsibilities entrusted to him. <coughs> Admiral Holloway continued, the records of the Bureau of Naval Personnel indicate that at the time the above mentioned portion of the Officer Personnel Act was implemented for the heretofore retired officers Rear Admiral Kimmel's name was withheld from submission to the President. The records further indicate that Rear Admiral Kimmel is the only flag officer on the retired list who has not been advanced to the highest held rank on active duty. <coughs> Admiral Holloway concluded with a recommendation to advance Kimmel on the retired list. The Chief of Naval Personnel respectfully submits that it would be a gracious act on the part of the nation to afford Rear Admiral Kimmel the privilege of advanced rank on the retired list. Attachment F, Admiral Burke's 1991 letter to Secretary of Defense Cheney. It is my considered judgment that when all the circumstances are considered, that you would approve this posthumous promotion and recommend it to the President. This conclusion was reached not because of the importance of this matter to the Kimmel family, but because of the importance to the Navy as an institution. Attachment G, the Director of Naval History, Admiral Sam Cox, Navy Day message to every Admiral in the United States Navy, December 7, 2016. 
An unstated reason for denying Kimmel a requested court martial is that a trial would have risked the reputation of many senior military and government officials in Washington, D.C., who were far more culpable of the failures that led to surprise at Pearl Harbor than Kimmel was. Attachment H is the Cryptolog Book Review of Summers and Swans, A Matter of Honor by Captain Raymond Schmidt. Attachment I is the 37 Admiral's 1991 letter to President Bush 41, which was updated in 2006. <clears throat> the letter in, well, six former chiefs of naval operations, two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and a director of Central Intelligence, Trost, Burke, Turner, Moore, Crow, Holloway, Zumo, Hayward, in addition to 26 other four-star admirals, have supported advancement of Rear Admiral Kimmel posthumously on the retired list in writing. Attachment J. This is the first page of a 12-page memorandum that I wrote entitled Reasons to Support the Advancement of Rear Admiral Kimmel on the Retired List. The full text of the memorandum is available on my website and is the subject of a separate graphic presentation by the same name, also available on my website. Attachment K was a Library of Congress Veterans History Project interview of me on July 15, 2017. It's available on my website. It's also available on YouTube. Attachment uh, L is an American Valor interview of me on July 15, 2017. July 17, 2017. Uh, it's available to BCNR, but uh, there are some proprietary interests uh, involved, so it won't be on my website for another year. <coughs> Ditto attachment M, which is part two of the American Valor interview of me. And uh, attachment N is the graphic representation of uh, the reasons to support advancement of rear Admiral Kimmel on the retired list. This is part one of two, and part two of two is also available on my website. <clears throat> and that concludes my presentation. Uh, members of the Bureau for Correction of Naval Records, I thank you very much for your kind attention.